Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. We're talking about machine learning and AI. We were just getting into uh, top priorities. And uh, Melissa, let me throw it over to you. What's the uh, number one priority that you all are working on over there at Booz Allen? Yeah, and Carly alluded to this in the last segment, but what we call operationalizing AI, and that's mm -hmm. really driving user adoption. How do we get these capabilities in the hands of the warfighter, for example, or the end user so that they're, that they're usable and, and they're really kind of resulting in that human machine teaming? Um, and we focus on a, on a few key areas that are critical to that. The, the first is explainability. This kind of addresses the trust factor. How do we provide the tools and algorithms to help us move away from this notion of an AI ML black box and ultimately help drive trust and, and, and therefore user adoption? Um, this is critical to scaling enterprise capabilities and, and for users to gain confidence in the output of the models. Um, another key area to enable that is adversarial AI. How do we make sure we understand adversarial capabilities and ML techniques that, that they're going to attempt to fool our models? These pose a real threat to the stability and confidence levels and, and, and the outputs of the models. So we've created capabilities that help early, early detection of where we might have uh, adversarial AI vulner vulnerabilities in our algorithms so we can identify those early and uh, continue to evolve our cyber capabilities to, to, to throw those threats. Something we don't talk about as much, but is really important and our companies put a lot of focus on is around ethical AI. We're implementing corporate guiding principles to ensure that our AI is creating a beneficial, not harmful to human welfare and does not introduce bias within the model. So that's another investment area we're really focused on uh, that we also think is gonna contribute to driving user adoption. I'm glad you brought that up. Very uh, important topic and very timely, right? As we start to get the wide use of this, we start to see some of these, we'll call them unintended consequences, right? That we need to be mindful of as we embark on this journey using this very powerful technology. Brian, how about you at DIA? I know there's a lot of activity going on over there. What's the top priority for you all? So for us, everything with AIML begins and ends with data. So when we talk about projects that we're gonna take on and take forward, the first question and the last question is data. What data do we have available? What data do we need to get? How do we need to store it? How do we need to enrich it and prepare it for whatever the mission area is? So one of the things that we are pioneering, I'll say, but we've been doing it since the end of World War II, which is uh, creating gold copy standards for our data. So when our data comes into our enterprise, it does not change. We uh, instead enrich that with metadata. So we're ensure that we know when it was taken, who took it, um, the fidelity and providence of that data, um, and then uh, hash it so we know when it changes at the origination point. And by doing all that, we can then enable our data scientists to have a copy that they know is inviolate and has a pedigree behind it, and they can use that any way that they choose for their given uh, project that they're working on. Um, that's a marked change from where we have seen folks in sister organizations in our own, where they just go back to the well and pull that data back every time. That, well, that's costly. And there are changes in that data set that probably are worth noting, especially as Melissa was indicating that we have to think about what our adversaries are doing in, in this environment. It's, it is a dynamic combat environment from our view. So we believe that our adversaries, if they're not already, they will soon uh, move into that space and start to pollute data sets and also try to manipulate our AI algorithms so that they shape our perceptions. So we have already prepared for that future and we are insulating ourselves from that risk. Data, uh, you know, I love the concept of this uh, gold disc of data, if you will. And uh, certainly you hear the term data is the new oil. And, uh, and you have to protect it, including the integrity of it. Very important. I, uh, interesting uh, uh, concept there that you're describing. And I'm glad to see that you guys are attacking it uh, full force there. Nicholas, how about at Snowflake? A uh, lot of different activities going on. We're talking about data, data, data. Number one priority for Snowflake right now. Yeah, uh, thanks, Luke. I, I'll, I'll kind of uh, pile on top of what uh, Brian and Melissa were talking about. They're absolutely right. The gold standard of data, that gold disk copy that, that we need to have out in the world, 
Um, you know, Snowflake has made it very simple for, for different agencies or mission partners to share data between themselves, regardless of what cloud they're on. We're deployed in AWS, Azure, GCP today, uh, moving into the Gov Clouds. We're on MAG today. We're moving to AWS Gov Cloud. Um, I would say that uh, being able to share that single source of truth, you built your gold data standard, being able to share that gold standard out to mission partners, regardless of what cloud they're in, that's our top priority to go to, to Melissa and to go to Brian and, and evangelize those messages and, and build that, uh, that gold standard architecture that can enable the collaboration in the Intel community that it needs so greatly. Yeah, um, very important to lock that down and ensure that there's absolute 100% integrity. All right, we're going we're gonna to wrap it up here with uh, uh, our, our, uh, our, probably our favorite question, which is sort of paint a picture of the future. Tell us what it looks like around the corner over the horizon, maybe not necessarily in the Petri dish, but uh, you know, not tomorrow, so to speak. Chad, we're going to start with you at Data Robot. Uh, what's it looking like in a couple of years? in regards to uh, where you all stand? You know, again, I think to come back to financial management, if I were to say within a couple of years, where will the largest impact be in the government? I think you will see billions of dollars saved in improving and streamlining financial management. Again, it's not something that's talked about a lot, but there's um, so, many poss so much possibility there that could be executed today. And, and I see a lot of momentum behind that now. So I'd say as you, as you streamline financial management, use AI to, to um, automate repetitive tasks, to identify fraud, and then ultimately um, to be able to repurpose funds, as I mentioned earlier, that unlocks a lot of funds to then repurpose elsewhere and, and deploy new and, and um, more mission critical AI solutions. And then as I would say, where on the mission critical side do I see the most progress happening? I think it comes back to the sensor fusion and automating analyst capabilities. That's where I see a lot of momentum today as well. And I would say in a couple of years, a lot of the things that an analyst does today will be automated and they will be able to step back more and think about what they're seeing and get that intelligence aggregated out to the warfighter in a much more seamless way. It's interesting because we always used to have a concept in the CIO community, cut, keep, and reinvest. And you've just turned that to find, keep, and reinvest. And I think that's absolutely fantastic. Nicholas, how about at Snowflake? Uh, uh, what's it look like in a couple of years? What do you, what do you guys see when you peek over the horizon? Uh, what I keep saying over and over again, Luke, is, um, you know, in my private life, I don't know how to fix everything on my car. I don't know how to, you know, make the best financial decisions all the time. I have experts that I go to to give me more information to make better decisions. That decision making is going to come from artificial intelligence, I think, in a lot of our government agencies. But government agencies are very specialized in a lot of ways that are good for uh, the citizenry. Uh, I think what we look at in the future is a more collaborative government where agencies are collaborating, contributing information to each other to allow them to accomplish their missions in very unique ways. Uh, and I, uh, I'm looking forward to that because that's, uh, that's what we do very well and uh, it's a great place for us to be in. So I look forward to that. Data is the new oil and we certainly have to collaborate uh, to make it all work and, uh, and really leverage and maximize the use of it. Melissa, how about at Booz Allen? You guys got an incredible global portfolio over there of activity going on. What does it look like in, in sort of your sector, if you will, over the next couple of years? What are you all anticipating? Thanks, Luke. I think we were, well, I want to see things evolve to achieve real human machine teaming. We have a uh, concept uh, we've been applying called Analyst 2.0. How do we achieve true partnerships through the efficient, effective integration of humans with these ML and AI capabilities to really, truly automate tradecraft? Um, and Chad alluded to this, right? It's, it's the goal is to assist humans in their daily activities, not replace. And I think that's a common misnomer that a lot of people think these technologies are going to come in and replace their job when really it's just trying to automate and make their jobs more, more efficient through that time savings. Um, and, and we're going to build on this next generation workforce. I think you're going to see more of the workforce in the next few years come in with hybrid skill sets that have a deep understanding of the full data life cycle and how they capitalize on the advances in these capabilities. And it was, it was Chris alluded to this in terms of how DITRA is tackling tradecraft automation by bringing the business and, and mission process analysts together with your software developer and your data scientist. Um, I think that's going to help us achieve this vision of, of making sure that our AI systems are trustworthy and able to scale to support our enterprise operations at the speed of mission. Right. We're going to put some very powerful capabilities in the hands of these uh, 
uh, these data science and then as, as actually as Carly talked before uh, about these, uh, these operators right on, on the uh, right on the front line there and uh, want to make sure that we're doing all the right things to, uh, to be using those properly, etc. Carly, what does it look like as you all are, are cooking it up over there in the science and technology uh, division? Uh, what does it look like in a couple of years for you all? Yeah, thanks, Luke. Um, so at, at, at Niwak Pacific, uh, we have a long history of storytelling through video. Mm. Um, and we've done that both for internal stakeholders and external programs over the years. And uh, a few years ago, we made a concerted effort to develop a vision for the future, a 20-year vision. Um, and it's offered, it's offered through a command, what we call a command technical vision or a C4ISR technical vision, which, which is about a six minute short film uh, that features Kennedy, uh, which is our version of Alexa, right? An AI enabled command center of the future. And this is our 20 year vision. Uh, and we use it internally to galvanize the workforce uh, across many domains as we discussed in many diverse uh, expertise area, areas. Um, Internally, since then, uh, we've developed a, a series of prototyped up demonstrations that optimize the decision making for this command center uh, that uses data centric approaches, natural language processors, uh, machine, machine assisted decision making, uh, and user centered design approaches to rapidly deploy the advanced interfaces that are really required to, uh, to harness all this data. Um, we call this making Kennedy real. And it's turned out to be a real galvanizing force, as I said, internally, but also externally. Last year, we also brought it uh, to in our industry partners as well um, and are looking to establish several creatives, um, recognizing that uh, not all tech that we are interested in is developed by the government. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're certainly open. We've opened our doors uh, and are really uh, aggressively partnering with industry and academia uh, and our joint partners in this effort. And that's really neat. You mentioned Creta, and I also read where you all had done some uh, some challenge prizes too, as well, and some of the AI stuff. And it's really, again, back to some of the innovative ways that you all are sussing out some of this technology and bringing it in and and experimenting with it. I think it's fantastic. So um, right. um, uh, using every all. tool in our toolbox. That's for absolutely, sure. absolutely fantastic. Brian, how about over at DIA? What does the future look like as you all sort of look around the corner? There's a lot of things cooking over there. Um, what can we expect in a couple of years? So what's interesting about my business is that we, we follow the customer and where the customer goes. And so some of the things that we pay attention to are changes in how information is consumed generationally. So as our policymaker community is getting younger, uh, the way they consume information is changing. So mm -hmm. the Obama administration was the most famous uh, example of this, but uh, he wanted to see things in a more electronic format. So uh, the director of national intelligence delivered an iPad so that he mm -hmm. could consume intelligence. That now opened up a whole range of things that we can do now to present information to our senior executives in the government. Uh, you know, videos, interactives, um, you know, they can, interact with themselves and ask questions directly to the analysts through platforms just like that. Mm -hmm. So we expect that in the future, we're going to be producing more products that are less paper driven and more electronically driven. We expect that those products will have to have a very robust data back, uh, back end to them because we think that our future customer set is going to be incredibly inquisitive and want to, gonna, want to see more information about what it is they are consuming. And, um, and then they're going to press us and test us more on why we think uh, certain things. And they're going to want to see the homework. So uh, that's the vision that I think we are, we are building toward. And in addition to being able to serve our, our warfighters out forward as well, edge computing platforms folks have already kind of talked about, that is definitely a future that we see now. Uh, we see folks deploying, you know, handheld drones in the strategic capabilities office, for an example. So those are platforms we're going to have to feed and those are platforms that are going to create intelligence that we're going to have to consume and so those are the things we're drilling toward sure an interesting concept there about uh you know this all of a sudden you're putting an electronic device in the decision maker's hands so to speak talk about real-time data right uh that's uh that's fascinating and i'm glad to see that um uh is in the works there 
Uh, Chris, how about over at DITRA? Um, uh, what does it look like uh, as you look over the horizon? A lot of activity going on there as well. Paint a picture. Yeah, I mean, this picture is going to be kind of interesting. So as Melissa and Brian kind of pointed out to you, right, our whole thing is focusing on our customer base, which is combatant commands. But I think over the next 12, 18 months, really what we're looking at is um, from a data science standpoint, bringing in the right folks into our fold from a data science standpoint and looking at it from not only just the technologists and subject matter experts, but also bringing in the delta into the group, which could be an economist, financial analyst, somewhere in that aspect, because what you're looking for is the, the ideas to actually help drive the innovation across our platforms and towards our customers. That's one of the things that we're looking at. And I think the other part is we'll continue to expand our partnerships across academia, across DOD, and hopefully try to help um, solidify the machine learning, AI, DevSecOps uh, arena into some sort of standardization. I think this is a lot of flux right now, um, especially when it comes to ML ops and AI, and there's not a real standard across the board, even across DOD right now. So hopefully we'll try to help drive that and get some more standardization across the board so we all kind of agree on what, what really is data science or ML ops. Yeah, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is that's, uh, I don't want to call it the Wild West because that sounds willy-nilly, but, you know, look, you, you all are creating, you're inventing as you go here, right? And you're creating new and uh, 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 techniques, if you will, to use this capability, use it safely, use it properly, and yeah. use it effectively and efficiently. We, we are, and I think the other part of that too is ensuring that you have some standards of like a measurement, like have a goal of what you're trying to do, especially when you're doing, when you're piloting something. At least say, I'm trying to drive towards X, and even if you fail, you know that, hey, we can actually get rid of that theory, and now we need to move on to the next thing. So a, a, a Measurement of success is, is key across the board and having some sort of risk tolerance and, and pushing that out to the teams by saying, we will accept risk tolerance without any kind of blowback or punishment, if you will. Absolutely. And we always like to say these days, we're not failing early, we're learning early. Absolutely. We can talk all day about this and I really want to uh, thank all the guests. Um, uh, I know all of you are busy uh, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us for this program. I'd like to thank the sponsors here uh, for supporting us on this show. I'd like to thank the good people here at Federal News Network that make this program uh, so successful and enjoyable. And most of all, I'd like to thank you, the listening audience out there that tune in every month. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum, part of Federal News Network. <laughs>